Welcome back to another episode of the Resellers Mindset Podcast. My name is Mike, also known as the Used Book Guy on YouTube, along with my friend and fellow full-time reseller, Johnny B. We help people start and grow their reselling businesses from the ground up. We also have a weekly Zoom call and private Discord for all YouTube members. Head on over to youtube.com backslash usedbookguy to join the channel and gain access to the full-length podcast, Zoom call, and private Discord today. Let's get into this week's episode. What is up, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Resellers Mindset Podcast. Mike, next to Johnny, and we have a special guest this week. We have Rachel Poshmark and eBay seller. So for me, I am clueless when it comes to Poshmark. I've never even listed a single thing. So I'm excited to kind of jump into that platform and what it looks like to kind of be successful over there. So Rachel, thanks for coming on. Give us a little bit of an introduction, and then me and Johnny will kind of just take it away. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Good morning. Um, yeah, so I've been selling on Poshmark full time since 2017, um, but since 2016, and um, I basically was uh, I was in a job I wasn't very happy in that wasn't really working, and was trying to figure out like how to you know make money, and I was like, oh, how can I monetize my shopping habit because <laughs> I love to shop. And I didn't need any more clothes or shoes or handbags or any of that. So um, I, in 2016, I started selling and it kind of just took off from there. I had a little help and in within six months, I was, you know, doing pretty well and uh, quit the job I was doing. I was actually working in finance at the time and I was a licensed financial advisor um, and I spent a lot of time uh, doing paperwork, which I really don't enjoy. <laughs> And very little time doing the part I really did enjoy, which was helping people sort of solve their financial woes and get to their financial goals. And I have a very deep background in retail sales. Um, I worked in the high-end furniture um, industry and I managed furniture stores for many years. So like I, I really understood like how to sell and, you know, obviously doing it online was a little bit different. But um, yeah, so I got into Poshmark and pretty quickly found that um, I really liked doing it and it was a good way to make money. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> what? Um, here I, I am. <laughs> I didn't even know. Do you know what year Poshmark started? Um, yeah, I think uh, 2012 was um, actually the date that it started. And in 2013, someone sent me an invite. You know how people do, oh, I signed up for this new thing. I'm sending you an invite, sign up. So I signed up. So if you look at my account, it actually says, that I've been a member since 2013, but I don't think I actually opened the app until 2016. Like I literally didn't even open it. So in 2016, when I was like looking for a way to make money, I don't know, maybe there was a lot of, I think there were a lot of rumblings about Poshmark at that time because a lot of people I talked to all joined in that year. They they all started selling in 2016, like no matter what it says on their account. So that must have been a time when maybe they were doing a lot of uh, advertising and that sort of thing. And and it was um it was unusual for me because um I, I tell people one of the things about Poshmark that makes it really different than pretty much any other platform is that it's actually a social media site where people sell stuff. It's it's I mean, yes, it was born as a place to sell things, maybe you know, you're cleaning out your closet and you just want to like get a little money back for the things you've spent money on. So, you know, that's, it was really designed for like, you know, women who just wanted to like recoup some of their funds on the things they've shopped for that they don't wear, but it has, has, and had, it, it used to have more, a little, maybe a little less now, this huge social component, which is like in real life events, like Posh and Sips and Posh and Learns and Posh and Coffee, where people like Poshmark would send you a swag bag and you would have an event in your local area and you would invite, invite other Poshmark sellers and you'd all get together and hang out. But then inside the app, there's this big social component because unlike any other app, there's this sharing part, right? You have to share your, your listings to keep them sort of fresh and at the top of the feed. And while people don't really shop from the feed, um, sharing is an important part of the app. It always has been, um, whether it always will be or not, I don't know. It's the one thing people dislike about it, but it's also the one thing that makes the app so unique, um, unlike any other app. So I am not a big social media type person. Um, so for the first six months, I didn't have any clue. Like I didn't know that I was supposed to be sharing and I would just list stuff and then, you know, I'd sell some things and 
And then I went to what I guess was, I think it was their very, uh, or it was either the first or second um, Poshmark Posh Fest, which is like their annual convention, if you will, was here in LA. And I thought, well, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I should go. And since it's here in LA, I don't have to buy an airline ticket. I don't have to stay in a hotel. I can just drive down there, go to this thing, you know, just, I'm just out the money. It's going to cost me to go to this thing. And then I was like, you know, if I'm serious, maybe this is something I should do. And I met somebody there who was at the time, she was like one of the OG poshers. Like she'd been on it since the, the app started. And she was really into like teaching other people how to use the app. And she, uh, I remember her, her username was Queen Mum. I don't think she does much these days, but she used to put out Q-tips on the app, which were like little tips on, you know, how to increase sales, you know, best practices. So this was like way before, like, you know, any of this kind of stuff was happening. Any of the, the groups that you see now that have formed to like teach other sellers how to like be better. She was already doing that. And I happened to, um, they had a thing where you could sign up for a closet consultation because on Poshmark, your store is called a closet because again, you know, goes back to like taking the stuff from my actual closet and putting it in my closet on Poshmark for others to see. Um, and so she, uh, they were doing closet consultations at Posh Fest and I thought, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. I guess I should sign up for one of those. And all the other, uh, people's forms were full. Like they, they'd already all been signed up for. Cause I kind of just like wander. I went by myself. So I didn't like know anybody or anything signed up for a closet consult with her, which lasted about 10 or 15 minutes. And I had 1700 followers on the app totally organically for like the, the six months I'd been on, which is not great. <laughs> you know, like I'd, I'd started selling in, at the end of March and that was in October. And by January of the following year, I had gone from 1,700 followers to 35,000 followers, and I was selling pretty regularly, all because of what I learned from her in this very itty bitty amount of time. So that kind of launched my, okay, well, I guess I'm going to maybe like really try and do this. And in, in early 2017 was when I, I just, I quit finance. I was like, you know what, this isn't working. Um, I got into the industry in kind of a strange way. And I wasn't really very happy. And that was when I, uh, you know, decided to kind of go all in, if you will. So I need more yeah. insight on like this, this following thing. Like you're saying it's like a social media platform. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the like eBay has like, you can follow the store right on eBay. I know a lot of eBay sellers try to get people to follow their stores. So they can send coupons and things like that. Yep. Um, so the followers, basically, they don't necessarily have to buy something from you. They can just follow your closet. Yep. Um I'm curious, you know how many followers you have like today? Like Yeah, I think I'm at 600,000, I think, something like that. And um so yeah, I I of course 1 million, you know, I'm always trying to get to 1 million, but yeah, I mean, it, it, that is a huge component like because they're well one of the one let, let me go back a little bit. One of the things that she had um one of the tips she had shared with me, which I still share with others today because I think it was another one of those things that really made a huge difference besides, you know, the following and unfollowing. But one of the things she told me was that when you're brand new and you don't have your own followers and like you don't have, you know, a lot of sales and you're just kind of trying to get started is that you can use the following and the sharing to harness the power of sellers who have a lot more followers than you do. And so what she told me was go in the app and find people who have a lot of followers and share like five to 10 items in a block from their closet. And then in the feed, it's going to show up that you've shared a bunch of things in a row. So you'll be like a big block in their feed instead of being just like, you know, people share stuff on the app, you know, on the app and the feed one at a time. So you get a lot of like onesie, 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 twosies, things like that. But she was like, go share a block. And what will happen is that user will then share your closet and your listings to their followers. So when they share another seller's items, it goes to their followers. And so, you know, I would, I would pull up people at like 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, you know, whatever. And I would, I would do what she said. And I think that was one of the main reasons, A, I got so many followers in such a short period of time, but also, you know, as you do that, those people are now following you. So when you post new stuff, they see it in their feed. So 
that was a thing that I did really early on. I, I don't really do it anymore because I'm I'm at a point where like I, I I'm pretty hands off with the app. I have, you know, automation for most things um, because I don't have time to, you know, be doing this all day. But um, yeah, so so the follower count, while it's important, it's not like the end all be all because the reality is lots of people buy things without even ever following you because, you know, just like eBay, there's a search bar, you go and you search for what you want, and then you can scroll through, you know, to see what, uh, you know, who has what you want and that kind of a thing. So, but the constant sharing and following is like what makes it a social media app. There's also a lot of like commenting. So like, Unlike eBay, like no one is, you know, no one's sending you a message on eBay just to like chit chat or tell you like your items are great or your closet is great or like come to this event or go to that event or none of that happens really on any other app. But Poshmark has had that, you know, it, it's it's inside of the items. So like people will comment on items. There's just like a comment box basically under every item and you can talk about stuff and and people would make posts that were literally just for conversing, if you will, or That's like nuts. sharing That's information. Nuts. Like, <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine, right? Whole like, new world, Mike. No, yeah. dude. I, I, I could see the questions now about selling on Amazon on the random T-shirt that I have listed on Poshmark. <laughs> like, hey, how do I do this? Like, um, yeah. that is. It sound does sound like it can be very time consuming, like you're like you're saying. And I think uh, months ago. I heard a lot of chirping on, you know, the the YouTube realm of reselling saying, oh, you got to share your closet all the time. It's kind of a grind and things like that. So it is that is, uh, you know, a good, good thing when you you first grow in. Right. You're going to have to put in the time yourself. But once you get there, you got to start finding ways to kind of get out of that a little bit, because you would literally sit there all day long yeah. just sharing and responding to people telling you to, you know, go to this meetup or they got a question about this. That's I mean kudos to you yeah when I got to about three hours a day of sharing my husband was like I was on my phone all the time he's like what are you doing and I'm like I'm sharing he's like this is ridiculous you can't do anything else I hired a VA and so I hired somebody who was in Bangladesh and he used to share my closet for me I, he worked for me for about two years so you know good bit before I decided to just kind of automate everything because of the cost um and also like I I just needed something that I could control a little bit more he was great and I you know I was thankful that I had him when I had him but yeah it very time consuming but now you can actually share like back then it was literally one at a time now you can actually select a large number and share them all at once. You still have to choose them, but you don't have to open each one. Like before you would have to open each one and share it and open each one and share it. And yeah, it was real pain in the butt. <laughs> so on the listing side of things, how does it compare to an eBay listing? Is it more or less time consuming or is it completely just different? It is way faster. It's a much simpler uh, listing form. Like um, when I first started, there were only four picture slots <laughs> and which was like crazy. Like, you know, we, we all think back to like, oh, when, you know, eBay first started, people had to like send each other money in the mail. And now it's like, oh, there were only four slots for pictures. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there were only four picture slots, but the form is very simple. It's, it's a title, it's a description, it, you know, a handful of item specifics like size, color, category, um, and whether the item is like a new or pre-owned and that's kind of it. So it's really, really, really fast to create a listing. Um, but, and for years I did everything from my phone, everything, absolutely everything. It wasn't until I got cross listing software so that I could list, you know, on eBay and Mercari that I really started working from the computer. And so that was, that was pretty game changing, but yeah, in terms of eBay versus Poshmark, it's like Poshmark is like this much and eBay is like this much. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. So that was a little bit of a stretch. But I will say that though I really, you know, just started selling in earnest on eBay about two years ago, um, my eBay account is from 2002. So it's quite old. And I had feedback already as a buyer, which was a benefit. I think when I started, it wasn't like I had, you know, that big fat zero feedback and like nobody, you know, people didn't trust me or anything like that. I just kind of started selling right away when I listed on eBay. So, yeah. So. How is the customer support on an eBay to Poshmark uh, split? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, 
you know, it's gone up and down over the years. It's it's email only or uh, messaging, messaging and email only. So there's no, um, you can't call anybody, which has always been kind of a, a thorn in all of our sides because sometimes there are issues that are a little more complicated that it would just be so much easier and faster if you could talk to a human being. But um, they did add a couple of years ago, like dedicated support for Posh Ambassador to, or it might be for all Posh Ambassadors. So um, no, actually, I think it's just for Posh, Posh Ambassador too. So like we have a dedicated um, supposedly email address we can send stuff to that has like a different team and they're supposed to give priority. So, but pretty much otherwise, everything is kind of in the app, which is really hard. Um, you know, if there's an issue, um, it's really also quite difficult, like, to solve issues where like maybe you sent somebody the wrong item or something like that because like you don't have the ability to just send the customer like another label or to ship. I mean, I have shipped outside the app on my own dime just because for me, customer service is like top, top, top priority. Like I want my customers to be happy. And if that means I have to buy a label and ship something priority on my own dime, I will do that if I need to. Um, the tough part is, is like, you know, you don't really want to do much like eBay. You don't want to do anything outside the app because, yeah. you know, if there's an issue, like you don't have that support. Um, on the flip side, you know, it's tough because a lot of people are like, oh, there's no help for sellers and buyers. Oh, there's no help for buy. Like everybody's complaining. Right. But in reality, Poshmark, I, I think up until it went public and then private again, was actually pretty buyer sent I mean pretty seller centric like they they really were trying to keep sellers happy um you know they, obviously they need buyers to keep the app running but you know in that regard I would say that you know you would send a message and within 24 hours you would get some kind of a response from somebody who could help you so you know I I can, I can honestly say like these days yeah it's slower than I would like it to be a lot of times but it's not the worst. Like It could be worse. Do I wish there was a phone number I could call sometimes to solve an issue? Like recently I accidentally sent a buyer someone else's, like I sent them their item and then I must've duplicated the label and I sent them someone else's item and now trying to get that solved. I mean, fortunately we got it worked out pretty quickly. You know, Poshmark will just send the label to the buyer who received the incorrect item. They'll slap it on the package and it'll go directly to the other buyer. And you know, it, it, even communicating inside the app has gotten better because back when I started, you the only way to com to communicate was on items. So like you'd have to, and then everyone could see it. And it's like, sometimes you don't want that. Um, or you could comment inside of like a bundle, which is basically like their version of the shopping cart. Mm. You can add items to your bundle. You can leave the items, you know, no bundle, but still have a conversation in there. Now you can actually have conversations on a sold, like, on the sold listing or it's not the listing, but like on the back end that no one can see except Poshmark. So it's like you and the buyer and Poshmark. And um, so that, that made things a little bit better. Um, but sometimes they're kind of slow to respond, you know, Poshmark is um, because like, you just have to wait for somebody to see the interaction. Um, and I don't know how they do that on their end because sometimes buyers send you a message on their item that just says, Hey, thanks so much for accepting my offer. Can't wait to get it. Like, you know, you get those. And so I don't know how they differentiate. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's only when a buyer opens a, a case or something, but, um, you know, it, it could be worse. <laughs> right. It could be so, better. So I already know the answer to this because I actually sit in on your call uh, and it's right before Jack's call too. So I get like double calls. And um, I remember one of the first things I ever interacted with you, because I used to tune you out when I was waiting for Jack's call to be perfectly fair, because it's close. Well, that's what I do with Jack's call. I leave it yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I'm just working over here in this background noise. And I asked you, because I had no idea. I'm like, can you sell books on Poshmark? And the answer was. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. you can. <laughs> do I think so, it's the best place to sell books? Maybe not. <laughs> no, no. Uh, she actually took the time and did like a deep dive. Okay, what kind of books actually sell? I was like, oh, this lady's taking me seriously. I guess I got to pay attention to <laughs> Then I started paying attention a bit more. Um, you probably so thought what, I was going to be like, no, you can't sell books. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I just thought it was closed only. So what other things can you sell on Poshmark? Is it anything and everything? No. Um, so one of the things that um, can be an issue is that up until very, very recently, every single sale got a priority label. So the, the shipping is all done inside the app. 
like we don't have to do anything. Basically what happens is a buyer buys an item, <clears throat> a shipping label is generated and that gets sent to the seller. Seller prints it and slaps it on the package. The only time we ever have any ability to do anything with shipping is if the item is over five pounds. So that label is good from zero to five pounds. Once you go over the five pound mark, you have to upgrade the label. You can do it inside. It becomes very expensive um, because it's it's no longer like the negotiated rate that Poshmark gets. Um, but five, you know, you really have to like in clothing, you really have to work to sell sell something that's over five pounds. Um, and so the issue with that has been, number one, you can't sell anything that can't be shipped by air. So anything flammable, anything, uh, you know, with batteries, um, you know, that kind of a thing. So for a long, 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 long time, it was really just fashion items, clothing, shoes, handbags, accessories, and cosmetics, as long as they're new, um, were fine, as long as they didn't have like alcohol in them. So like powder cosmetics, things like that have been fine. And then they slowly started to add categories and it's a running joke. It's like every time they add a category that we didn't ask for, we're like, well, we didn't ask for that, but we did ask for you to fix the search, which we've been asking for like five years. Maybe don't give us a category for pet clothing because no one really cares about that. <laughs> so they added a pet category. And then more, most, most recently they did add an electronics category because people were selling hair tools. And so they wanted to, you know, because it's all things all kind of fashion related. So they did add a an electronics category. And if you list in the electronics category, you do actually get a ground label. Um, so like if it has a you know lithium battery or something like that, it's fine. Now, as to what people actually list on the app, I have seen everything from furniture to car tires to animals. Um, none of that is supposed to be listed, you know, just like every other app, uh, you know, people list things they're not supposed to. Unfortunately, unlike eBay, Poshmark is not very good about policing and removing a lot of that stuff. Um, so, you know, it tends, I, I think they've gotten better. It used to be really, really bad, but um, I think they've gotten better. But you know, primarily, I think it still remains today, mostly fashion related items, but there are a lot of people. So, oh, home decor was another thing they added, which actually for a lot of people has been pretty good. I have sold some home decor items because, you know, fashion for the body, fashion for your house, it's kind of sort of similar, um, you know, and there are a lot of like, you know, smaller items, you know, decor items that you can sell that you know, that are under that five pound limit. I've sold bedding on there, um, you know, especially if it's bedding that's like a collaboration with a fashion designer, um, you know, that's very applicable. Um, you know, a lot of the like the target collabs with different designers have a lot of home goods, you know, things like that. Um, but as far as books, and I have looked at the books um, because I think after you asked me that, I was like, oh, I go and look and see what kind of books people are actually selling. But you, you do see, like coffee table style books because, you know, while you have the media rate, you can't use it on certain things. And it it's only, you know, $8 to ship up to five pounds. And there really is nowhere else you're shipping five pounds of items for $8. So for certain things, it can actually be great just because of the shipping being so much cheaper. So like, I mean, I've sold dishware, I've sold candles, um, I've sold pillow covers, you know, not my main thing. My main thing is, you know, fashion, but if it relates and it can ship in the same system, why not? I, um, I got a crazy idea that came to my head. Maybe, maybe some washed up celebrities will watch this and make some money, but like, are there like famous people in there? Because I feel like it'd be yes. cool if I could buy like Tom Cruise's t-shirt from like his personal closet, right? Like, I feel yep. like there's something so I mean, serena I mean, serena williams has actually partnered with poshmark and she has a closet and has sold a number like they'll do like big drops and everything sells out in like an hour um dj khalid is that um he has has uh, had a lot of stuff up there um you know all of his like track suits and things like that like um there have been a number of celebrities i don't know them all I, I, it's kind of like not really on my radar so much but it probably should be but yes they do and of course you know the celebrity themselves probably isn't managing it um and they do have uh they have a different back end like the like poshmark is doing special things for them so like they can sell things like in a little bit of a different way than the, the casual seller um we're also starting to see a lot more um closets opening up for volume sellers from eBay. Um, so basically what's happening is like these sellers that have, you know, 10,000 
15,000, 20,000, 30,000 listings or more on eBay. They're somehow, I think they're using software. I don't, I don't think it's like this software I'm using, but they're basically just migrating or, you know, copying those listings over into Poshmark. So you'll open up a closet that's six months old that has 150,000 listings. So like there, there's a lot more of that happening. I'm also starting to see drop shipping, which I think is interesting because that is expressly not allowed kind of like it is on eBay. So, but I think that those closets have some kind of a special, they have something because they're drop shipping this stuff from places in Europe. So I don't know how that's working. They're getting a FedEx or a yeah. DHL label. They're not using obviously USPS, um, but I've, I've seen a lot more of that very recently. So, so how does that affect you who's been there this whole time and then all these dirty eBay sellers are coming in with their fancy software? That is the million dollar question. Um, you know, there's one thing that, you know, we talked about sharing before. One of the things that people have been asking for, like since day one, is to be able to just push a button and share their whole closet. And a lot of us, people like me are like, you actually do not want that. You you don't understand that if you ask for that, you're 300 item closet, no one will ever see your items because the people who have 10,000, 20,000, you know, some of these newer ones, they're going to do that. And your entire feed is going to be everything in that closet and no one is going to see your items. So when, even when they added the bulk model, you can still only do, I think 200 at a time. And it does it in a way that's kind of slow. So like other listings are coming up in between. So you know, that that is kind of like the the issue with some of these larger companies, though I've noticed that I think a lot of them don't even really share, which is like this. They just dump all their listings there. And the, the issue for me has been price because I've seen a lot of things being dumped on Poshmark that are being sold way below what the Poshmark price would be. And then I'll go and try and list something and some gigantic closet from eBay has opened and has that item priced at half of what I would ask for. So right, for the, me, the prices aren't comparable because of the platform difference. It makes sense. Yeah. I have noticed in general, since I started selling on eBay, that things don't sell as high there as they do on Poshmark. And also things that I have sold lots of on Poshmark, there's like zero history for on eBay. Like they made me sold one, two years on Terapeak or none. And I've sold literally like hundreds on Poshmark. So that, I mean, that's the other thing. I think it's not often not the same customer. You know, it's a different customer shopping there. So that that's been a little challenging for me in terms of, you know, knowing what to list on eBay and figuring out like the customer over there versus the customer in Poshmark. But I try not to worry about things I can't control. Um, you know, my my what's important to me is to list my, my listings, good listings every single day, you know, much like we preach in <laughs> and learn. I'm also in the, you know, in the tech and sports group um, is to just be consistent, list the best items that you can at the best prices and, you know, treat the customer right. Like all of that applies. And I, because I've taken that mentality, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about what other people are doing. I, I, I can only control what I'm doing. And so because of that, you know, my numbers have always been pretty good and pretty consistent. I can't complain. Of course, I'm, I would like to level up. And that has been a kind of a big thing for me. I did double my numbers when I came into the group. So from the year before I did twice as much my first full year in the group. So that was huge for me, huge. So, um, you know, that was kind of a big deal, but yeah, as far as like things that are outside my control, I can, I can complain about it, but like, what's that going to do, you know, or I can just go to work and, you know, I always say if people spent half as much time working as they did complaining, they don't make more money. He's one of us, Mike. We complain about the criers <laughs> you, all the time. You would be a huge YouTuber if you just complained about reselling platforms all day long. I, I know. It works. Um, now, I'll, don't get me wrong. I'm a, I'm a born complainer. I, I, I'm I'm a I'm a Jew from New York, and like complaining is in my genetics. But like when it comes to stuff like this. I think maybe because I have such a deep retail background too. It's like the customer, just take care of the customer, do what you got to do and make it happen every day. And, you know, I complain, but I don't, I'm not out there like complaining on social media or anything like that. <laughs> I will say what uh, Rachel didn't want to say is that you pesky eBay sellers that think cross-listing your stuff is going to fix your business. You are dead wrong. Your junk yeah. is going to sell on eBay. It definitely ain't going to sell over on Poshmark where there's a completely 
different clientele, which is going to lead me into the next thing. You know, uh, Poshmark's kind of you know, your main your main gig here. Does eBay only exist for you because you have the software to cross list? Like if you had to manually list those items on eBay that you have on Poshmark, would you even bother with eBay? Or is it just the ease of getting more eyes on your items because you have the software and it doesn't take much time? Uh, the first thing you said, um, because what happened was I have been, I had been saying for years, I was going to start cross-listing and I actually bought software and paid for it monthly and never used it. It was just clunky. I didn't like it. It didn't feel easy. And so I, I, I just was paying for it every month and I wasn't cross-listing because for me, if it's difficult or it's like, it means I have to learn a new thing. I'm probably not going to do it. <laughs> so, um, so I would say it, well, it was kind of a twofold thing. The first part was that I really wanted to make more money. And at the time, though, I don't know that I believe this is true at the time, but I mean, true now, but at the time I was like, I think in order to make more money, I have to list on other platforms because a lot of the big sellers were cross-listing. They weren't only selling on one platform. And also I was starting to feel a little capped on Poshmark. Like I was increasing my listings, but like my sales weren't necessarily going up. Now I will preface this by saying I was not as consistent as I am today. So that, that was a big difference. But so when I first started like really selling on eBay, my friend was already doing it. And she was like, oh, you gotta, you know, you gotta cross-list all your listings to eBay. And that was when I I added Vendu. Um, I canceled that other subscription. I added Vendu. I, I was friends with another person at the time who was like really into Vendu. She was like, you gotta, you gotta use Vendu. It's fantastic. And let me tell you, those first two weeks using Vendu was like, I mean, it was like learning to ride a bicycle. It was so hard. It was <laughs> just like completely changing my mindset from listing on Poshmark to listing in this app I had never, you know, used or seen before. Um, but once I got the hang of it, it and it got really easy, I, you know, my goal was just everything goes everywhere um, because you never really know what's going to sell on what platform. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy about cross list, don't cross list, you know, um, and my thought at the time, I was I was a little disenchanted with Poshmark. So I thought if I can get my eBay store selling as much as my Poshmark closet, maybe I'll drop Poshmark and go to eBay. But instead, what happened, my sales went up by, you know, so much that I was like, now I don't want to give up either of them because I'm making sizable income on both platforms. eBay still is my second. Um, it, I have not been able to get it to the same numbers as my Poshmark closet. And I think a lot of it has to do with like, I know the Poshmark customer, I know what they buy. And I I still buy for Poshmark. Like there are things I do buy for eBay that I'm like, when I'm in the, the store, whatever, it's like, oh, I think this might sell better on eBay versus Poshmark. And then sometimes, you know, it's a surprise because you think the thing you listed on Poshmark that sell better on eBay sells on Poshmark or vice versa. And it's, you just never really know. But if I'd had to do it manually, no. I, I never would have done it like it just because it's just one more extra thing that wasn't easy. When you cross list, I'm curious because I have no idea. I've never cross listed a single thing in my life. Does it so you create the Poshmark listing and then you cross list that to eBay or do you create the listing in the software and then it just pushes them out to both? I create the listing in the software and then in the software, there are pages for each platform I list on, because as you know, the item specifics are different on every platform. So then you can go in and make the adjustments on each platform before you list it, but everything is done within the software. And so then you launch it from the software, but it's a great inventory management tool. Um, it's a great inventory management tool. It's also a great um, analytics tool. Like I can see all of the sales on all of the platforms, it gives me like lots of pie charts and graphs so I can see like which platforms are perform performing better, which items are selling better on which platforms, you know, all of that kind of a thing. Like I can see in total, like what are my, you know, is women's tops like my number one, you know, selling item and vice, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it, it does give me a lot of analytics, which are really helpful. But yeah, I now I do everything inside of the program. Not everyone does. I know there are a lot of people who actually create their listings on eBay first because eBay has like the most item specifics of every plat of any of the platforms. They then import that into the software. And then from there, they will cross list to their other platforms. I'm probably a pretty like 
as far as users go, I'm really only listing on two platforms. I I, ha- I had been listing everything on Mercari also, but it, it was taking more me way more time than it was worth. So now I don't really list any, like I stopped listing there in like February completely. And now I put things up if it, if it doesn't require any changing to the form, like if I can just literally, you know, put in the shipping and press list. But if it, if I have to like start collaging pictures because I don't have enough picture slots or, you know, anything like that, doing anything special, it doesn't go over there. Um, but truthfully, it's, it's a, my least performing platform, but there are a lot of people who l- list like, the software I use has 12 platforms and they're using, you know, five, six, seven, 10. I've seen people listing on 12 platforms. I don't think they're making more money because they're selling on 12 platforms, but that's, (laughs) that's a different conversation. So do you find it harder to source for Posh versus eBay, or is it easier to source for eBay than it is for Posh? Um, you know, it, this is an interesting question because I think because I'm used to buying for Poshmark, it's easier for me to to source for Poshmark. Um, I I am also like a low volume, higher dollar seller. So it takes me longer to find the items. You know, I actually list yeah, a Your relative- sourcing time takes much longer, of course. Yeah, it takes... Although I live in LA, so it doesn't take a lot longer um, because there's a lot of good inventory here. Um but yeah, and I'm not, because I'm not huge volume, I don't need large quantities of inventory, but I do need quality inventory that's going to sell at higher prices. Um, so that's, you know, can be a little more challenging because, you know, you have to go where the, the stuff is. Um, I do pay more for a lot of my items, but uh, they sell for a lot more. So I don't really like worry about that too, too much. Although I have kind of brought things down a little bit in the last couple of years, just because <clears throat> excuse me. I was doing a lot of luxury at one point and the margins are on luxury are very small. <clears throat> and I felt like it was tying up a lot of capital for too long. And so I've really pulled back from doing luxury. I, I liked my sweet spot is like 50 to $150. That's, that's pretty much where I want almost all of my listings to be. Do I still sell things for $15 sometimes? Yes. Do I like to? No, but it happens. But on the flip side, there's plenty of days also where I sell items for two or three or four or $500 that more than make up for those few items I have to sell lower. But I like to keep like, I like to have items in the 40 to $60 range because that customer is shopping all the time. Whereas like the person who's buying, you know, a $250 item, like that's going to, there are going to be a lot fewer of those. Um, and I've just learned that that it's better to cater to more people than it is to sell higher items, higher dollar items to less people. Um, you know, and and I, I do take a lot of um, tech's advice to heart. You know, some of the money all of the time is is a big one because I used to be all of the money some of the time. And that was a big change that I made that that made my growth happen so fast. Why I dub- was able to double was I, I started doing that. I was consistent. I cons- I listed the same amount every single day, no matter what. And I accepted a lot more offers. I was just, you know, if I was happy with the ROI, I accepted the offer. I didn't worry about like whether or not I thought this item would sell for like another $50 or, you know, or other people have sold it for more money. I stopped looking at a lot of that and just started paying attention to, well, I paid five and this person's offering me 50. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm just going to accept. And that alone really increased the amount of cash flow I had and didn't change my profit margin at all. That's the nice. funny part. That uh, is a little <laughs> funny. Yes. Yeah, it was bizarre. So, so walk me through because you're you're on the higher end of uh, the sourcing thing, so it's going to take longer. What what's your sourcing week look like? I don't need to know where you're going, but how does it work? So it really depends. Uh, one thing I don't do that I know a lot of people do do is I don't source every day. Um, I sometimes don't even source every week. So I eliminated my death pile in 2023. I was like, this is costing my business money. This is not, I I can't do this anymore. And I completely stopped shopping in 2023 and only listed from my death pile. And it took me nine months to sort and list and donate and get rid of everything. But by September- How much were you cursing during these nine months? In the beginning, a lot. (laughs) Towards the middle and the end, you know, there were things like, oh, I found things that were damaged. I found things that um, (laughs) 
were worth a lot of money. And I listed them, they would sell in like 24 hours for like $300, you know, so that was hard. Um, there was a lot of stuff that was probably worth something when I bought it and wasn't anymore. So it was a lot of sorting. It, there was a lot of bags going to donation. There were things going to buy, sell, trade. It, it just kind of like, and once I got in the groove, it was fine. And the other thing that happened was my bank account filled up, which was fantastic. So but now I don't do like I don't have a death pile. So basically what I do is I will source and depending on how much I source at any given time, that stuff has to be either in the queue or listed before I will go and buy more. That's a hard but, line rule for you drawing. Yeah. The same now. yeah. Nothing goes into bins. Like if I have to start putting things into bins because I'm running out of space, then I'm over shopping and I can't I have to not do that anymore. So, you know, it. so when I'm kind of just doing things regularly. I usually source once a week and I spend the whole day sourcing because I have some physical limitations. I, I have some back problems. And so for me, when I spend time sourcing, I'm kind of done for the day. Like there, there isn't anything else that's going to happen that day. So I can't source every day um, because as we know, you need to get there early and be there for, you know, be out there for a few hours in order to get the best stuff. And I do that. And then the, the rest of my day is shot. So I usually source one, sometimes two times a week, depending on like how much I get. And and then all of that gets processed. And then by the next week, I have room. But like just recently, I purchased, uh, you know, ha I have opportunities at certain times of the year to buy bulk. And so I just purchased um, like 200, a little over 200 pieces from one vendor. And now I won't source probably for the next I didn't source last week and I probably won't source for another two or three weeks until that is all like drafted and, you know, down to like maybe 20 or 30 pieces. I, I list 10 a day. So, you know, 200 pieces is, is, is only 20 days. It's not like it's that, you know, that much stuff. Um, but I like I don't go out and like know that, OK, I only need 70 items for this week. I don't go shopping and buy 70 items and then stop. If I'm if I'm hitting, I'm going to keep going until I can't either can't be out there any longer or can't find anything else. And then I'm going home. Um, but so I'm, I'm not counting in that way. But I don't go and like source again next week if I have, you know, if I bought like 100 and something pieces and I don't need, you know, my however many pieces so the media sellers need to listen to what she's saying i know a few <laughs> of you are over by just a few not just media clothing sellers are very bad also like very very bad um because a lot of us like to shop like it's like we like the you know i mean let's be real a lot of these people have death piles i myself because they have shopping addictions it's not because like they need more stuff so you know i had to examine all of that too when i went through my death pile and now i'm like the death pile police <laughs> in the group i'm always like oh you you have to stop shopping, but it's hard, you know. People don't be are, me. Don't be me. <laughs> don't yeah. be me. Yeah. So, but no, yeah, no more death piles for me. Um, and yeah, I, I don't. I, I can see when it's starting to get like a little too much. I, I like my racks. Like I like my room where I have the inventory to just be to be empty. It like feels so good when there's like almost nothing in it. So yeah, that. So last question I got for you before I let Mike. Uh ask his question so what are your grand aspirations are you plan to remain solo or do you want employees do you want a dedicated workspace outside of the home what are you wanting so right now i have kind of an ideal setup because although i'm in this beautiful space with all of these uh you know my inventory and this is literally just workspace this is actually completely separate from my house but attached to my house so i have this space where i can like leave my house and all the distractions that are in the house and come to a space where I can just work. And then I have photography and unlisted inventory in the house um, in one room that's dedicated. Like when we moved to this house, I was like, these are the things I need for my business that are non-negotiables. And if it doesn't fit, then we got to keep looking. So um, at this point, I don't want to grow a whole lot. Uh, I have about 2,300 active listings. And I think for the next few, you know, year or two, I don't think I want to go above 3000. I think that's kind of my cap. I, I would like to stay in this space. Um, I had storage units when I had a death pile and that was part of my problem. <laughs> so never again on that. Um, if I, you know, needed to move to a larger space, you know, is that something I've considered? I have, um, you know, being in LA, unfortunately, 
everything's at a premium here. Um, I actually looked for two years for an office space. Uh, and then when we realized we had to move, I was like, forget that. Let's just get a bigger house and whatever, you know, extra we have to pay. Um, and I actually pay separate rent on this space it's completely under my business. So, um, you know, is it more than renting a storage unit? Yes, but I can work here. I have electricity. I have air conditioning, you know, all those things. So, Yes and no. I mean, I've had I've had assistants. I've had two assistants over the years. Um, I found that mostly they just kept me from doing my own work and didn't really help me increase my income, which was obviously very problematic. Um, I've learned a lot about adding and having employees through a lot of the talk in the group. Um, I just added a new virtual assistant who is just going to draft for me. Um, and so far, so good. Uh, because I would like to increase my listing, my number of listings each day. But part of my problem is that in order to do that, I probably need to spend more time sourcing. And if I'm spending more time sourcing, I can't do all the other stuff. So um, the fantastic part about adding her was that she came already trained. So um, I literally just have to, I had to teach her to use my software, the cross-listing software and, you know, do a little bit of tweaking to the listings that she's been creating, but I venture to say her listings are better than mine. So um, <laughs> that's the funny part. So in that way, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am considering, you know, adding people, you know, I also don't have to like manage her. She's not here. I, you know, as long as she's doing what I need her to do, like she's not underfoot, she's not somebody I end up chit chatting with because, you know, there's another person here. I can still focus on what I need to get done. You know, obviously anytime you hire somebody, there's some growing pains to, you know, get them going, but she's been, she, she actually started about a week ago and so far everything has been really, really good. Um, you know, obviously there's a little bit of a risk you run to every time you add somebody, you know, you need to make sure that your, your listings are still correct. You know, things aren't going up with mistakes. Um, fortunately she's very detail oriented and because she came already trained and has been working for my friend for two years, who is actually lists a lot of very similar things to me. She's already got all that. Like she knows how to describe flaws, like all of that kind of a thing. So, you know, the, the tough part is like, you, you know, she can only do what so much she can do from the photos I send her. Right. Cause that's all she's getting. She doesn't have the item in front of her, but you know, that, that has been good. But as far as like, do I want to have a 10,000 item store? No. I mean, I think part of it too, is that I don't want to list. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to list a lot of items at low dollar. I'd rather list fewer items for a little bit more money. You know, as I mentioned, I have some physical limitations and like, as it grows, that becomes much harder for me. So, um, no, I don't want to have like, I don't, I don't need an empire. Um, would I like to double and triple my income? Sure. Yeah. But like, like we talk about in the group, I'm doing it slowly and kind of anytime I add something or I change something, I spend a lot of time with that thing before I decide to like make another change or add like the VA thing has kind of been in my mind for a while. Um, but I, I kind of, I really just wanted to do everything myself keep it under my control. But now I really want to increase because I want to increase my sales. And in order to do that at this point, like everything else is kind of, I, I, I mean, I would like to increase my, my um, sell through rate. That's the other thing. So, you know, I may start doing more discounting, more sales, things like that. Um, but I needed to increase my listing goal. And it, I think that for me to try and do it on my own is hard. Uh, you know, to, to some people, 10 a day doesn't sound like very much. But I spend a lot more time on that 10. I do more cleaning and prep, you know, my photo, you know, I, I do a lot more in terms of my photos because I'm asking, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the buyers to pay more money for these items. And so I will sell something for a lot more than somebody else who has the exact same item, the same size and color, but looks, they look, it looks like they pulled it out of the bottom of a hamper and they're selling it for, you know, half the price, but people will buy mine because of presentation and because I, I write a better listing. So, you know, I hate to say it, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and I've, I'm learning to let some things go because there are a lot of things that are just like not that important that don't make that much of a difference. And, you know, um, tech had someone on his podcast a few months ago. And one of the things they, they had mentioned, and I I'm looking over here because I put it on a post-it by my desk, but it was do less, but better and addition by subtraction. 
So knowing that like adding things doesn't always make it better. Sometimes in order to make it better, you have to subtract things. And so, which is hard for me, but <laughs> I <agree>. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, I agree 100%. I get a lot of flack because I tell people I only work my Amazon business for 20 hours a week. So you just think, well, this person's a slacker because he's only doing it 20 hours a week. Yeah. But then they don't realize the back end. I'm probably making double, triple the money they're making working 50 yeah. hours a week doing the same exact type of business. But I got a few rapid fire questions for you that I've written down over here. Um, Poshmark, do they allow offers? Like, can you send offers on yes. Poshmark? In fact, most sales come, <clears throat> excuse me, from offers and their offer system is what eBay built their off. They, they basically built it, built it to try and mimic Poshmark's offer system, but yes. And there's no cap, you know, people can send you an offer of any amount. Um, and I would say a very large, and actually, uh, I can see that in the app, how many, um, or I, I can actually, I think I see it in Bendu, um, how many sales come in from offers versus buy it now. Um, and a, a large, very large portion come from what about, offers. What about yeah. promoted listings on Poshmark? Is that a thing? <laughs> it is, but it, it's not something I use. Um, so they started a promoted listing program. I think it's been around about a year now. And it's pay-per-click. So uh, it's, yeah. So um, you're paying for clicks and impressions. Um, when they first released it, there were almost no analytics. And so people were like, what am I paying for? Um, they gave everybody a free trial. Like in the very beginning, you got four weeks and then they dropped it down to two. And um, and then they're, they're still pushing the two week trial and you have to put in a credit card. So basically what happens is after that two weeks, if you don't go in and cancel it, you just start getting charged. Um, and basically what they do is they tell you choose a budget like for the week you know it's by, it's by the week based and then they give you a suggestion based on your closet size which is always way more than it should be um and then and that's literally the only thing you have control over you can't control what gets promoted how it gets promoted where it gets promoted um and and all the promotion is inside the app so there's no there's no outside advertising so basically like eBay the promoted listings are coming up on the top, but they're also showing up in searches that they, that isn't even remotely related to what the buyer searched. So in that way, it's useless. Um, I told them, and I, I've had a couple of meetings with Poshmark about it. I talked to them about it at Poshfest and I told them that I will not be using it until it's a pay if the item sells. I am not paying for clicks and impressions. I can't make money off of advertising. So I have very, very strong feelings about it. And I did the two-week trial. <clears throat> I did the two-week trial and then I paid for two weeks just to see because I felt like two weeks, I, I couldn't really get anything in two weeks. In the first week, they claimed, um, I think it was it was a couple hundred dollars in sales. And this is the other reason why I, I have a problem with it. Uh, five, I had, think I had five sales and four of those, I had already had communications with the buyer prior to the item selling. And then they claim the item sold from the promotion. So that was a huge thing for me. But um, the analytics have gotten a little bit better. But again, you have no control over what gets promoted and where. And, and from a buyer's perspective, what I see is I search for something and the promoted listing listing one or two or three of them will just keep showing up as I'm scrolling the same ones. It's like, I didn't want it then and I don't want it now either. <laughs> so you can show it to me a thousand times. I don't want that. So I think people are paying for it, thinking that they're getting some kind of priority, but the reality is like, it's not really doing anything. Um, and what was crazy was in the last week, I didn't, I don't think I made any sales from it. So in, on the fourth week, I turned it off. And like three days later, I had like a huge influx of sales. And I thought that was a bit strange. People have reported other things like, oh, I turned it off and my sales dried up. But my question is always like, what else did you change? Have you been listing? Did you list every day during those four weeks? Like, you know, so I, I will never use it until they change it to a model like eBay's, which is, you know, you pay when the item sells. Does, because... does Poshmark have like the algorithm? Like you're talking about, you got to list like every day. Like, will they hate you like eBay does if you don't list every day? So I think it's a little less sensitive in terms of like daily listing. Um, but it, just like any app, it wants to be fed regularly. 
And so you can keep sharing the same items over and over and over again. And if you never put anything new in, your sales are going to go like this. <laughs> like that that is how they all work. It, it's just they do have an algorithm. I don't think it's as sensitive as the eBay algorithm. The one thing we've always been told is that the algorithm is always changing, but we will never know what it is, which is the same thing as, as eBay. They're, they're all like that, right? But again, I can only control what I do. And if I know that I'm listing every day and that is making me sales every day, then that's what I'm going to keep doing. And I see so many people complaining on social media that their sales dried up, but then they say they haven't listed anything in a month. And it's like, I, I don't, I don't know what you want. Like that, that's not how these things work, <laughs> you know? So is it as sensitive? Probably not. Does it want to be fed regularly? Yes, it does. Does, does Poshmark have like feedback? Not really. <clears throat> um, or feedback in terms of like the buyer to the seller or feedback, you mean like, like you got a number, right? eBay's got that little silly number, like, oh, Johnny P's always talking, oh, I got a thousand feedback, three thousand feedback. Like, does oh, that exist on Poshmark? So there is feedback. Um, it is not uh it is not the same as eBay. Basically, it's um so when the when the buyer buys something, they could they can rate, they don't have to, just like on, you know, it's on a star basis, so one to five stars. Then there's places for like things that you can improve and like a comment, which we call love notes. So if you put in a five star rating, your love note shows up in your um, like your about page. So people can go there and see like, you know, how many love notes you have, what people have written in those love notes, but they can't see anything less than five stars. No. <laughs> Some buyers have gotten savvy and they'll leave you five stars and then write you a negative. Um, but you can remove those. So uh, that's the only thing you can remove because you can only remove um, love, love notes with five star ratings. Everything else, no one sees. So basically, like, it doesn't really matter. But like, you have, you know, a five star rating. If you get enough bad reviews, your rating starts to go down. And, and that is visible if they go into your like about page. But just shopping, like it doesn't come up in your closet title or anything like that. I mean, I, I, even with all the sales that I've had, I have still a five-star rating. Like I'm very proud of that. Does it mean anything? Not really. I mean, it's, it's not like it is on eBay where somebody might not buy from you if they go in and see you've had like right. a lot of negatives in the last six months. So, so on the same line, are metrics as important on Posh as they are eBay? Like if you don't ship, what happens? Um, well, if you, no, they aren't as important. Um, there's no, like, because there's no, you know, top rated versus, you know, above standard versus below standard. Like there isn't any of that on Poshmark. So, you know, that I think on the back end, it might affect you. Like, I do think that Poshmark is saying like, this person doesn't, takes a week to ship. We're not just going to like show their items to everybody. So, I, and there is also, um, there is a back end closet score, which we can't see. We don't know what affects the score. Like there's a lot of rumblings. People think they know what about it, but like it doesn't really do a whole lot. So it's not like, you know, if you take a long time to ship or you never ship, you get penalized, which is actually a problem in my opinion, because there's a lot of abandoned closets on Poshmark. And the problem, as we all know, is that somebody will go in and buy something from one of those abandoned closets. It never gets shipped. And they don't just not buy from that seller again. Yep. They don't buy on Poshmark again, yep. which is a problem. So we have been asking literally for years to do what Mercari does, which is if there has been no activity after 30 days, just shut it down. Like you can just keep it there, but hide the listings so people can't buy them because it, it leaves a negative experience for a lot of people. I, to me, a sale is like a bomb. It's like a ticking bomb. When a sale comes in, I want that bomb out of my hands as quickly as possible. I will ship same day. If I have not gone to the post office, uh, I'm packing that and, and shipping it with my stuff. So, you know, there are unfortunately, so so the whole moms or whatever selling the clothes from their closets, it's a pro and a con because a lot of those people, they're not on the app regularly. They're not shipping their orders in a timely manner. They don't know how to ship. You get like packages that have like items rolled in a ball, like just stuffed in a poly mailer that's like recycled from like the Amazon order that they got that has like a bunch of tape on it because it had holes in it. Like, or, you know, the items come reeking of perfume or what have you like, or pet hair. I have gotten a lot of things with pet hair. Like, so, so that 
that is, you know, it's an issue. And people don't seem to understand that, like, when you do that, you're not just affecting you. You're affecting everyone because that buyer is not going to come back to the platform because they had a bad experience with you. So, you know, I, I, I think that there are a lot of things that they could be doing better to make the buyer experience better. Again, I can only do what I can do to control, you know, so I make sure that my buyers are as happy as possible. And when somebody tells me they're brand new, like this is the first purchase they're making on Poshmark. If they've told me that before I ship their item, you can bet that package is going to be even nicer than it would if it was just me. But I get comments all the time about, oh, my my packages look so professional. Everything is clean. And like, and literally all I do is put it in a plastic poly mailer, stick a thank you sticker on it and shove it in a Tyvek envelope and off it goes. But Everything is folded neatly. You know, there's no lint. There's no dog hair. There's no odors. Like, you know, I clean everything. Like, you know, there's a lot of debate about cleaning, right? We're supposed to clean things for eBay. Well, we have to clean things for Poshmark too. Like, I want my buyer to have an experience like I would want to have. So that's how I do everything. Um, it's It is makes you wonder, right? Like if people are like, oh my God, this is beautiful packaging. And you're like doing just like what you would assume is the bare minimum. You're like... And I try to get this over to people. I've talked about it before on the podcast. If somebody ships something in a pizza box on eBay, that customer is gone forever. So yeah, yeah. it sucks for the, you know, you might be like, oh, look, that's funny. But at the end of the day, like they're never going back on, like I'm not ordering off eBay if someone sends something in a DiGiorno box like ever yeah. again. And I do think there is something to be said, hot take incoming. We need way higher standards across the board. I saw on Amazon, and they don't play that crap. You get a refund for any reason. You can't do nothing about it. And if you mess around a little bit too much, guess what? You're out the door quicker than you got in the door. So I do think that is, I guess, kind of the benefit. And it kind of keeps a lot of the slackers away because uh, let's face it, the people doing this stuff, they don't care. They don't care about their, they don't even realize it's a business. They list this stuff up. They, they could care about anything else besides that money hitting their bank account. So it is at the end of the day, without customers, none of these platforms exist, but on the other side of it, eBay, Poshmark, they don't want to lose sellers because all of a sudden now, hey, we expect you, right? You sell something on Amazon, you ship it yourself. It's can't. It's got to be an unbranded packaging. They don't want it in any kind of box that's got any kind of label on it. And if these other platforms do it, you kind of push away the smaller sellers, which in turn are paying the fees, a lot of the promoted fees, a lot of the source subscriptions. I get it, but I do think there, there at some point there has to be a conversation of, all right, anybody can be a reseller, but we still need to have some standards across the board here. And I do think whatever platform kind of jumps on this first, we'll see an influx of more customers because everything's going to be better, right? If we have certain standards, higher standards for sellers, then every experience with customers should be better. I do think whoever kind of hops on that first, whether it's Macari, Depop, Etsy, eBay, I think it's going to be a huge benefit to that platform. I hate you know, like I, whenever I buy something off eBay, I'm just like, what is this thing going to show up in? It's just like, <laughs> I'm just waiting for it. I'm just like, it's going to be a disaster. And then just the label on the product. Yeah. I have yeah. gotten a lot of bad packages recently. And it's just like, how, how, like, it, how can you ship like this and think it's okay? Like it, this is, it just doesn't. And, and here's my thought because I come 100% agree with you. My thought is this, have you ever received a package in the mail? Because if you've ever received a package in the mail, you know what's acceptable, right? Even like most bare bones companies, like take Nordstrom, for example, and people will consider Nordstrom like a luxury department store. Your item comes in a poly bag in an unmarked box. And usually there's not even any dunnage, like, but it's arriving in one piece. It's clean. And it's in the condition that it was set. Like, it's so simple. It, it's not hard. That's the thing. Like, if it was difficult, I would understand, you know, and especially on Poshmark, because all of the packaging you can use for Poshmark is free because we only ship priority. So there's no excuse. You don't need to use, you don't need to recycle a box. Just go to your post office and grab, you know, a piece of USPS. You don't even have to go to the post office. You could have it delivered to you. Yeah, but you're really well, that's what I world. do. But you you're know, if you're not the a world by not recycling, <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> shame, shame. I do recycle <laughs> my boxes for eBay, but I have standards for what those boxes look like. They need to be clean, you know, they need to not have holes in them and be falling apart, you know. 
but I do, I, I'm big on recycling, but you know, on the flip side in, for a long time, Poshmark was encouraging people to put more packaging, like, you know, wrap it in tissue, put a bow on it, include free gifts. And I did that for a long time. And I was like, I'm going to stop and see what happens. And you know what happened? Nothing. Like you, you I ate sales. all the free candy you were sending. <laughs> that's what happened. But I have had a few, few people give me four star ratings because my I didn't put any unicorns and rainbows no in the box. Yeah, no. But candy. you know what? Candy. I want my candy with my clothes. <laughs> you know, but but it's so simple to do. You really can do the least and still make the experience for the buyer okay. Like it doesn't have to be a luxury experience but like maybe just fold the item before you put it in like i i ordered three items off of ebay i i i was sniping some items i sniped three items for one seller and she was clearly she even mentioned in her listings that she was like listing stuff from her closet okay fine i could see there was pet hair on the things in the pictures they they literally look like she had pulled it out of her hamper now as a as a fellow reseller knowing what i was going to do with those items that's good for me because no one else wants those items, but I know I can bring those home and clean them and present them in a better way. I received the package two days ago and literally she had taken a poly mailer and just balled up the items and stuffed it in. <laughs> so all three items were totally wrinkled. One was covered in pet hair and like it was, and I'm just thinking, thank God I'm, that this did not go to an actual buyer, like a, a real end user. You're a true humanitarian. <laughs> <laughs> you saved that reseller. I mean, I received shoes once $150. No, actually, I think the retail was over $200 for these shoes. Another snipe. She put them in a box that was too shallow and put them standing up instead of like, you know, sideways. And the backs of both shoes were completely crushed because when she closed the box. I'm not a shoe seller and I know that. There was also no wrapping. They were new buck oh. and they were literally just put in a cardboard box. It's no plastic. So nothing. Anybody can do this. Anybody can sign up today and sell today. That is the big problem with the, yeah. the, the reselling world in general. Because it's hey, like you, you should have to sit through a tutorial on like how to do it well before. <laughs> yeah i mean Your amazon amazon they make you have a video call they make you do all oh. this stuff like it's it's brutal to start on amazon and uh i'm kind of glad that i am focused over there because a lot of the riffraff goes away pretty fast but we're going to wrap it up here rachel where can people find you i usually ask this before like we start recording and i forgot because i was i was a minute late johnny was about to call me on the phone and every, <laughs> listen i got cats i got to change cat litter in the morning dude so like yeah you got to cut me some slack here so where can people find you rachel <laughs> those cats are high maintenance um i am raise rack pretty much everywhere r-a-e-s-r-a-c-k um on instagram on poshmark on ebay um, I'm not a big social media person, although I'm thinking about maybe like giving my Instagram account a, a little attention, but, uh, yeah, same across the board. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the best way to find me. All right, Rachel, all the links for that will be down below as well, pinned in the comments section and in the description. We appreciate you sharing your Poshmark knowledge with us today. And while we're looking forward to see, you know, what 20 listings a day looks like for you and probably revisit in probably a year or two and kind of see where you're at from here. So thanks for coming on with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Reseller's Mindset Podcast. Today's full episode and all previous episodes are available to all YouTube members along with the weekly Zoom call and private Discord. Head on over to youtube.com backslash the used book guy and consider joining for as little as $2.99 a month.